Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, Labor Senator Sam Dastyari, Senator-elect Pauline Hanson, whose One Nation Party will win at least three Senate spots and she believes could win seven. Greens Deputy Leader Senator Larissa Waters, Minister for Education and Liberal Senator Simon Birmingham and Nick Xenophon, who will now lead a team of three Senators. Please welcome our panel. Well, as usual, you can watch Q&A live across Australia on ABC TV News 24 and listen on News Radio. And we're streaming Q&A live on Facebook where you can watch, you can make a comment or you can ask a question. Let's go to our first question in the audience from Prabhaseka. From the recent attacks we have seen in France yet again, it is evident that there is a rise in homegrown terrorism where boys and girls are being radicalised from a young age with consequences that we've seen here in Australia with the death of Curtis Chang in Parramatta. My question to the panel tonight is, do you put forward any strategies for early intervention to curb these individuals from going down that path and committing these abhorrent acts of terror? Larissa Waters, we'll start with you. Thanks, Tony. Look, that's a really pertinent and fantastically phrased question, Prabha. Um, we absolutely need to intervene so that young people or any people aren't radicalised, and I believe that we can do that. Um, we've had some wonderful social cohesion programs previously in this nation, some of which were sadly defunded when the Abbott government first came to power. Um, but I believe it's, it's not too late. I think we have a fantastic and strong multicultural community in Australia that we can build on and further strengthen. What I'm concerned about is the uh, fanning of the flames of fear and divisiveness. I think that will not make us safer. In fact, it will make us less safe. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone feels included and welcomed and a part of our community. That's how we keep safe and strong. And if we uh, demonise people, isolate them, um, call them names, fear monger, then we simply push young people towards radicalisation. Now, that's a, a task for all of us to not participate in that sort of divisive, inflammatory and totally incorrect language and conduct. And it's going to be a very interesting <coughs> parliament in that regard. Pauline Hanson. Um, quite interesting what you were saying, Larissa, and, and I'm sure that was you know, pointed at me about demonising. It is a huge issue in Australia and we haven't had terrorism on our streets before, you know, it's just in these last decade that we have experienced it and we are experiencing it around the world. You've got to ask yourself then what's behind it and why is it happening? I haven't got all the answers. But the thing is that you've got to deal with why the radicalisation is happening, why people want to go out and create terror to destroy lives, create murder and fear on our streets. I haven't started this. This has been happening for many years now. And we have terrorist attacks that's happening around the world. To bury your head in the sand is not the answer to it. Radicalisation is not just happening by fear-mongering, you know, by words because I'm asking for a debate and find the right answers. This is happening on the internet, it's happening around the world because people, either for whatever reason, are drawn to a religion or an ideology that is not compatible with the Western way of life and is having an impact on our culture and our way of life. I'm concerned for every one of you here in this audience tonight and everyone at home because I want safety on our streets. I want to find the right answers. And it's important for each and every one of us and for the future generations. To ignore it is not the answer to it. To think that we can um, define the easy answers, it's not but pulling together as a community and as a nation to debate the issue, mm. then we can find the right answers. Pauline, um, we'll come back to what uh, you believe some of those answers are in a minute. Sam Dastyari. Uh, look, uh, uh, there's so much there to unpack that, that we'll have plenty of time to do, I hope, tonight. Um, this issue of radicalisation is a real problem and it's a real concern. And you have to ask yourself, why would there be young Australians that have grown up here 
and been part of our society that feel so alienated, so disincluded from our society that they take these kinds of extreme steps. Now, we have a responsibility to make sure the right Muslim voices are being promoted. We have a responsibility to acknowledge that there is a problem. But we also have a responsibility to make sure that we're not fanning the flames of extremists who want nothing more, nothing more than for Muslims in Western nations to feel uncomfortable about being there. That is the path to division. That is the path we cannot go down. Simon Birmingham. Well, thanks, Prabha, for the question. And look, really, the first point is prevention. Prevention for new migrants comes from having successful resettlement services, supporting those migrants in terms of learning English if that's necessary, supporting them in terms of accessing training to help them get into the employment market. Uh, for homegrown radicals, uh, uh, that of course really involves making sure that through our uh, schooling programs and education system uh, there is strong sense of inclusion, again strong pathways and hope that people will be able to succeed and fulfil uh, their aspirations of uh, work and opportunity. But of course where those things don't work, where prevention doesn't work, then the battle becomes one of identification and intervention. And we have been taking steps to make sure that in our schools there's greater support uh, for teachers uh, and the school community to identify risks and threats. Uh, that there's that understanding in uh, communities, uh, particularly Islamic communities where uh, we all acknowledge there is a particular potential problem uh, for those communities to feel comfortable, family members, leaders in communities, to refer young people who they think may be at risk of radicalisation to authorities uh, because we want to make sure that we get those early interventions in place and the types of changes we've made to laws in recent years have allowed more of those types of early interventions to occur to prevent the types of atrocities that we've seen overseas largely from occurring in Australia. Not completely, sadly, uh, but we have had success through the types of strategies that we've been deploying today. OK, and Nick Xenophon, and we'll hear everyone just briefly and then we'll get into what will be a debate, I guess. In direct answer to the question, of course we need to do more in terms of counter-radicalisation programs. I think uh, Senator Connie Ferranti wells I think both sides of politics, uh, all sides of politics have said she's done terrific work in the past uh, in terms of de-radicalisation programs and engaging with, with uh, with all communities, uh, but I think there's a two-pronged approach. More on de-radicalisation, uh, also to look very closely uh, at our uh, at why some events have occurred. And I think there's been a failure in terms of policing or intelligence is still beyond me. Why a man Haron Monis was on the streets when he was and 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 did what he did. And I think that. Uh, points to some systemic failures, which the coroner, New South Wales coroner is going through. But, but in, in answer to your question, uh, I think that the key to this is that you, uh, you marginalise the extremists and the preachers of hate, uh, not an entire community. And in terms of the broader issue about uh, Islam, the world's biggest uh, Islamic nation happens to be Indonesia, our, our neighbour to the near north, uh, where they have had a stunning success in becoming a democratic country in the region. And I think we should all be very proud of that. And it's an example of an uh, a nation, predominantly Muslim, uh, where they've done tremendous things in terms of being a strong democracy with a strong free press. OK, let's go straight to our next question. It's from Cindy Rahal. Go ahead. Hi. My, my question is for Pauline. Now, you've called for a Royal Commission into Islam to determine whether Islam is a political ideology or a religion. Can you please explain what constitutes a religion and what constitutes a political ideology and why Judaism, Judaism Christianity um, fall under the banner of a religion, even though Islam, Judaism and Christianity all stem from the Abrahamic faith? Islam does not separate itself from political ideology. And whereas the Christianity under the Westminster system, we are you know, separate the rule of law from the, from the state. So they are separate. Islam doesn't. And a lot of the countries that are ruled under Islam is their ideology, the political ideology. Now, I understand Islam does not believe in democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly or freedom of the press. You have Hizbat Tahrir that preaches the fact that they will um, want total control of the people 
Paulie, can I just That's... interrupt you there? I mean, can you make such a blanket statement? Islam doesn't believe in democracy uh, when north of Australia is the biggest democracy in our region and it's Islamic. Exactly. No, look, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that because you've got a lot of countries around the world, they, they have a political ideology that want to control the people. Now, I want to see a separation of, of the you two. Don't think this that's is true. what I'm you saying. You don't think that's true of what, Indonesia, though, do you? What I think they control the people and their beliefs. I really do. And the people control by it. You know, we are a Christian country, and I don't believe that Islam is compatible with our culture and our way of life. And that's why we have problems in Australia on the streets. And a lot of people are opposing the mosques that are built here. Can I just and let uh, Cindy, Cindy Rahal, I think, probably wants to get back in to answer. Uh, you, you've been listening to this. What do you think? Yeah, I, I just, I think that Muslims in Australia have constantly been telling people like you and who support you that that is not what Islam is about and it's falling on deaf ears. And I think you have very selective hearing and what you're creating is not one nation, you are creating a divided nation. If you want to have a look at creating one nation, you need to look at ways we can include everybody, all the Muslims and any other religion as well. Um, you have a very one-track mind and unfortunately it's very dangerous. We have terrorism. OK, thank you. We have terrorism on the streets that we've never had before. We've had murders com committed under the name of Islam, as we have the Lint Cafe, Curtis Chang, and the two police officers in, in um, Melbourne. All right? So this has happened. You have Can I just radicalisation... I'm sure the, Pauline, I'm sure the fact-checkers will be onto this, but when you say we've never had terrorism in this country before, that's simply not, not the case. The 1970s, there were multiple bombings by Croatian Catholic extremists. Um, this has happened right. in Australia before. It's not the first time. We should at least get that straight. All right. I accept I, I, that. I'd just like but to say that um, you're in a position now where you can make a change. I think you should use that position positively instead of driving this fear amongst the community. Why don't you look at domestic violence? Why don't you look at education? Why don't you look at health? You're in a position that many Australian women would envy, that envy you and would like to be in that same position. Why because, are you, because why are you pushing Australian... this f agenda and, and, and pushing fear into our community and making people like myself and my friend here worried to come into the studio because of protesters outside? Protesters are nothing to do with me. The protesters were there that support you against me. Pauline, that support okay, you. Cindy, no, that... we're just going to uh, let uh, Pauline Hanson just quickly answer that. I'd like to hear from the other panellists as well. So, Pauline, a, a brief answer, if you wouldn't mind. With what question about the protesters outside? The protesters were you. against yeah. me because I, I choose to speak up against this matter. So I have protesters which are trying to shut down freedom of speech. You know. I want answers to the questions. People in Australia are in fear because they can't walk in the streets. They fear of terrorism, which is happening around the world. Why? Because of Islam. Because you have the radicalisation. We just all spoke about radi radicalisation is actually happening in Australia. Who is it under? On what religion? So-called religion. So we okay. actually have to find the right answers to this so we can all live in peace and harmony. Uh, Paul, there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to go around the panel and get their response to that. Start with Sam Dastiari. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just I'm a little bit flabbergasted here. The politics of fear, hate and division is not the politics that we should be espousing as a nation. And look, you know, Miss Hansen here is not an amateur. She's not inexperienced. Miss Hansen, you've been in politics now for 20 years and you know exactly what you're doing and the language you use and the power of your language. You know, 20 years ago, it started off with blaming Indigenous Australians. Then it became about we're being swamped by Asians. Now it's about blaming the Muslim and the Muslim community. It is the politics of pitting one section of our community against another section of our community, about simplifying complex problems and placing the blame on one group at one point in time. It's the politics of fear and division. And Miss Hanson, you're incredibly good at it. Okay. So, you can say we have radicalisation of problems in our country, yet then you put it back on me that I'm, I'm creating fear. So you, you're saying that 
terrorism and the fear on our streets so people don't feel safe in this country or what's happened in Nice or what's happened in Paris or what's happened in Germany and other countries around the world or America. M so that's M not Hansen, actually happening. I'm saying you play so, the politics of fear and hate because it serves your political interests I and you've been doing it for the past 20 years and you're very good at it. Uh, can I just leave you two there for a minute? I want to hear from the other side of the panel. And we'll hear from Simon Birmingham first. Uh, the Royal Commission uh, that was uh, suggested in the question. Um, I presume the government will rule that out. Uh, indeed, Tony. Now, Cindy, wasn't it? Cindy, yeah. I understand your concerns. Your concerns as, um, uh, as uh, a Muslim woman living in Australia uh, that you are worried, uh, as I know many others are, uh, about your place in Australia. Uh, and the type of country we are in welcoming you. We also have to acknowledge there are around 500,000 Australians who voted for Pauline's party. They have worries, and many who didn't have worries uh, about terrorism, uh, about threats that exist. Uh, our responsibility, I think, is of course how we reconcile that to make sure that you continue to feel that this is a country that you are free to practise your faith in, respected while practising that faith, but that others equally feel safe and comfortable that the government is not only doing everything possible to protect them, uh, but is being successful in doing so, and that we actually do create the type of environment uh, where it doesn't matter what your religion is, what your background is, you actually are living as an Australian, uh, in Australia, in a country that celebrates and recognises, as we have done for a long period of time, as the world's most successful multicultural nation, celebrates and recognises those backgrounds, but we can't be blind to the fears that are there either and to the fact that terrorism, Islamic terrorism, has become an increasing problem in po pockets of the world, has threatened us in certain ways, uh, and therefore we have to be ever vigilant in that and ever vigilant uh, in explaining calmly and rationally to Australians as to the types of steps we take to protect them so that we make sure we give that comfort to all Australians. OK, but, but just a quick follow-up there. I mean, do you, you talk about calm and rational conversation that needs to be had over this. Um, do you believe that a call for a Royal Commission, that a call for banning all Muslims from coming to Australia as immigrants, do you believe that falls into that category? Because that's no. part of the One Nation platform. Uh, no, I don't think a Royal Commission uh, would be at all helpful, uh, and I don't think that bans on certain categories of people are ever helpful, Tony. So, you know, the government's approach will absolutely be one to ensure everything we do in our powers to deliver safety and security for Australians. Uh, but that safety and security includes being a harmonious, welcoming country where all Australians feel free to live, worship, as long as they are living according to the laws of this land. Uh, Larissa Waters, um, you can come in on this question. Look, Cindy, can I thank you for your articulation and can I apologise to you? I think what we've seen tonight is that uh, many Australians don't share the views of some folk on this panel and I, I do want to deeply apologise that you feel in any way discomforted or unwelcome in your own country. <coughs> I think that is grossly unfair and utterly uncalled for. Um, I, I, I think it's wonderful. Are you apologising for the rest of the Australians who actually feel that well, they... I, do, I do want to come to why I think well. people have voted for your party polling because I actually probably have a different perspective on that one. But just staying with Cindy, um, thank you. Um, I, I have a bone to pick with Pauline in regards to your statement that we're a Christian nation. Actually, I think we're a multi-faith nation. Um, indeed, we're a nation of people who sometimes don't have a religion. Um, I think we are a broad spectrum. We are diverse. That is our strength. That has been our strength um, ever since our formation. Uh, clearly, we have some serious reconciliation and reparation to do with the first Australians, um, but we are strong in our diversity. Um, thank you. I also want to add that I think it's somewhat ironic that Ms Hansen is um, objecting that her freedom of speech is somehow being restricted because there's people protesting at the front of tonight's show when, in fact, she's seeking to silence your freedom of speech and your freedom of religion, which I object to. And, uh, Nick Senefon, um, a brief answer because we've got quite a few questions to get through. Well, I, the, the, the brief answer is this. You cannot simply... You cannot uh, uh, use the actions of a few... <coughs> 
uh, to ascribe them to many, to many hundreds of thousands of Australians who are here in this country because they want a good life, a peaceful life. They want their kids to have a good education. They want the opportunity that this great country has brought. And I'm very proud of the fact that my parents came from war-torn Europe over 60 years ago for a good life. And, uh, and I think that's what 99.999% of uh, those that come to this country actually want. OK, Pauline Hanson referred to the scepticism among some Australians about Islam. Our next questioner, I think it's fair to say, shares that. Caroline Freckleton. Good evening, panel, um, and thank you for the debate. It's been very interesting so far. Um, with the proposed increases in um, Muslim refugees and um, probably the fairly rapid growth in uh, the population of the, the Muslim group, um, a lot of Australians are concerned that many Muslims are not fully uh, willing to fully integrate into our community. Um, so my, my question, main question is, do you think politicians are being extremely arrogant or extremely naive in thinking they can change the, the 1,400 years of indoctrination um, when integration has been largely a, a failure? or resulted in only a barely tolerated coexistence wherever large Muslim populations exist in Western countries. And secondly, a minor question, but is the dinner for leaders of the Islamic community held by Prime Minister Turnbull uh, recently evidence of the growing political power of, of that group? OK, Simon Birmingham, the, the dinner, first of all, and um, well, we'll the, keep the, our answers brief if well, we can. The, well, the dinner, first of all, was, Carolyn, a, a multi-faith dinner. Um, yes, and obviously did mark um, uh, iftar, I think, uh, from memory. And, uh, but it was attended by uh, leaders of many different uh, faiths. Uh, and, of course, it was a reflection uh, of the reality uh, that if we are, uh, firstly, to uh, successfully ensure that all Australians live harmoniously alongside one another, uh, we need to promote that type of respect across faiths. Secondly, a reflection of the reality that uh, if our security and intelligence services who are tasked with uh, our protection in terms of identifying problems are to succeed in their job, then they need, which means government needs, uh, the cooperation of community leaders uh, to make sure that those isolated instances are identified as quickly as possible. Uh, Sam Dossier, I'll bring you in. The questioner asked whether politicians are being naive or extremely arrogant uh, in relation to Islam. Um, I think we're being neither. Look, I, mean, just, I look at this, and I, I, I can't not but look at this from my kind of personal story. Um, I was born in a small town in northern Iran. When someone like Sonia Kruger goes on this morning and talks about banning Muslims uh, from coming to the country, or it's black and white in Pauline Hanson's policy document, what they're effectively saying is people like my parents shouldn't have been allowed to come to this country because of, of where they were born. And it's hurtful and it's painful, and I look at just what my parents, and not just them, but so many other Muslim Australians, so many other migrants, so many other, the hundreds of thousands of migrant stories. And when I look at, Ms Hanson, when I look at your policy document that turns around and says that we should be banning Muslims from coming to this country, I have to ask, does that mean that a five-year-old Sam Dastiari should never have been able to set foot in Australia because somewhere in Tehran, there's a document that sits that says beside my name the word Muslim because of where I was born. Are you a Muslim? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, there was... Yeah, and I've never hidden away. No, no, no. So were you sworn in under the Quran? I was born in an Islamic nation. And by so being you're born a Muslim? in an Islamic nation, I was born and under Iranian law, under Islamic law, under a place like Iran. And my parents fled, and now fled to be able to Muslim. come to this, this country. This is quite interesting. Are no, you practising no, Muslim? So what? Miss Hanson, I think you're trying to make a joke of what is no, a I'm, serious... No, I'm surprised. I, I didn't I think know you're that about a joke. you. What, because he doesn't have three so heads? What, what, because I don't have three heads. <laughs> Ms Hanson, when you have a policy document that says in black and white we should be banning Muslims from coming to this country, I can't help but I interpret it about what it means. Well, I, well, I for think people we need like a my family and well, the hundreds of thousands of migrants who've come from the Middle East and from around the world, yes, it's very personal. And I, you know, you mentioned Sonia Kruger. I'm saying, go, Sonia, because I think it's great that someone actually is standing up because she's expressed her feelings about it. She referred to Japan, that 
you know, for a population of what, 127 million people who actually have 100,000, they don't have terrorism on their streets. You've got Brussels now, the biggest Muslim, um, you know, state there with 300,000 in there. You've got 10% in in France. You have the problems on the streets of France. So you want to let five? So you want to let five-year-old Sam Dastyar into the country? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm no, no, no. Would you have allowed that... a five-year-old Sam Dastyar into this country? <laughs> I came to this country on the 16th of January 1988, two weeks before, two weeks before the bicentenary celebrations, and my family has done nothing but contribute to this country since they've been here. I'm and yes, they came you, from Sam, a Muslim country. I'm so happy that you've come here to Australia. So, but Pauline, that's, Pauline that's, Hanson, could, could, could you, but could you right. just answer the very All basic right. question that he threw up there? The basic question is, would you, would you be happy to see him blocked from the, someone in his position okay. now? In, you, in, who's being persecuted in another country? Well, you that happens to be, that, that happens to be, Hang on, just finish. There happens to be a Muslim. Would you be happy to see that five-year-old blocked from coming here? Muslims have been a part of Australia for a long, long time, many, many years. When you go back to the gold rush days, and they were in here in Australia. But it's only in the last, what, 10, 20 years that we have seen a rise of terrorism on our streets. You've got to ask yourself the question: Why? Why is it because happening? we invaded their countries, right. Paul? It's not about invading. <laughs> we went to war so with their nations so and that, killed so that, their people. So that's so the Ms. reason Hansen, why. So, Mr. Hanson, a five-year-old Sam so Bastiari can't come to this country now, but I could have come 28 years ago. Sam, we have problems now. That, that, to take it back there, that's absolutely ridiculous. What you're talking about. All right. That we're is exactly about, what we're talking it about. It's in your policy document. About, it's black and white in not, your policy no, document. Sam, you're talking about something that's ridiculous back when... How long ago? How I old came to you? this country 28 years ago. That's 28 years ago. We're talking about now, what is happening now and the day, today in the world with the terrorist attacks. So today I couldn't come to this country right, sorry, 28 I'm, years I'm ago. I'm going to put you both on hold because we've actually got... I'm going to come to our next question, which is from Khalid Elamar, because that will also feed into this discussion. Everyone can get involved in that. Uh, Khalid <laughs> Elamar, go ahead. Senator Hanson, my 11-year-old son who is watching this program right now recently asked me what is Islamophobia. Rather than explaining it to him with my own words, he and I sat down side by side and watched a few of your past and recent videos. Then I asked him, what do you think Islamopho Islamophobia is? His response was someone that hates us. I said Islamophobia is one or a combination of three things, hate, fear or ignorance. I promised him that I will ask you this question so you can hear the answer from yourself. So with all due respect, Ms Hanson, what is the basis of your Islamophobic feelings? Hate, fear or ignorance? None of the above of what you've just said, all right? What I'm concerned about, and your son may be watching, but also other children may be watching this as well, and who want to live in peace and harmony in this country without fear. It's about us getting on together as a nation and working together with that fear amongst us. Why have we got so much fear on our streets? Why did the Link Cafe happen? Why did Curtis Chang? Why is he murdered? Why is other things happening? Why are there terrorist attacks around the world? You know, we need to find the answers to this and why the radicalisation? Why have we just recently had another three men wanting to leave this country, or five it was, to actually go and fight for ISIL. Yeah, I say, please go ahead. Why? Simply because people like yourself, who have extremely dangerous and disturbing rhetoric, it's a fuel to hatred, bigotry and ignorance. You should listen to what you say. No, I Because your, say your, 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 your policies are a sim sim simply are a contradiction to your own One Nation Party. You're not so, creating a One Nation Party. So you it's are just, all right You are creating your... a dysfunctional country by isolating a religion, 20 years ago, isolating a race, and you keep on going down this track, I will fear for my wife's life. I will fear for my kid's life. Who is an Australian born? I work in Cronulla. I have worked there for eight years. I absolutely love the place. Only recently, after your rhetoric has come on, on board the media, 
almost every day I get called a, a Muslim pig because of you. No. And I really do thank you for that because it just shows how much of a better person I am that I can choose to ignore these guys yeah. and remain the person that I am. So, Pauline, can I, can, I, can, I just, can I just put this question to you? I mean, you know um, that Mr Elamar's son is actually sitting watching this. He just told you that. Can you offer him any hope that you regard him as an equal Australian along with all other citizens? There are a lot of Muslims, and there are actually Muslims of my party who have joined my party, who want a peaceful life in Australia. They don't want the terrorism. Isn't it funny that your grand mufti won't even come out and condemn the terrorist attacks that's happening overseas? Or imams or people that say that, that they have no intentions of assimilating into our society. Or when you have problems in communities because people are living in fear. Why do you reverse it on me and say you're blaming me for the problems in Australia? When Is it, we but, have but, but seen Pauline, what has happened... Pauline, can I just... Can I put this to you? Is it possibly because you've asked that no more mosques be built in this country? That you've asked that no more Muslims was, be allowed to enter this country? Wasn't it the Do you truth think, no, that... So, but can I just put that question to you again about that yeah. young boy who's sitting watching this now? About how it feels. But I like I said, like I said to you... Can you, offer him, lot... can you offer him any hope that you regard him as an equal citizen? He is an equal citizen. As long as he wants to give his loyalty to this country and it's not torn by a, an ideology that has hatred towards the West or infidels. Okay. You know, you have problems that are happening around the world. Radicalisation is about hate for the infidels. You know, this hatred wasn't created by me. It's under the belief of the Islam. Look at, read the Quran and what the Quran preaches in it. It's hatred. Even Ayan Hussein Ali has stayed, and she's travelling the world. She's saying she was a Muslim. She said, be you know, aware of what this is all about. If you want to sit here okay. and, you, and just, you know... Uh, as I'll go back to the same thing. It's just thing. the politics it's, of hate, Pauline. It's the politics it of hate. It is not the politics of hate. It's the politics of, of division. It's the politics of disunity. And you play it, and you've played it for 20 that. years. Sam, it was Indigenous Australians, then it was Asians, it for, now it's Muslims. Because you've got the votes, because it's actually growing in numbers, in, Muslims in this country, that you are It was are Indigenous, then it was it. Asians, now it's you're, Muslims. You're OK, I'm so sorry. I'm going to sorry, uh, I'm gonna pause the side of the panel again to hear from this side, and I'll start with uh, Nick Xenophon. Well, I just... Uh, what's there to say? I mean, I think that... Uh, well, you're going to be living in the Senate yeah, yeah. Um, with a large number of <laughs> One Nation and, and you're a block of votes, so you're going to have to work out how to live together in the Senate. Uh, and where there is common ground, uh, if it's issues about Australian jobs, Australian-made, um, signing up to trade agreements which clearly aren't in our national interest, I will work. OK, with, what about the issues colleagues. we're talking about? Does it concern you that the Senate may, be, may become a forum for this debate pushed by One Nation and others? The Senate is a forum for matters that Senators want to raise and if Senators and uh, Ms Hanson's entitled to raise those issues, she's been duly elected, you need to respect that. It doesn't mean we can't have uh, vehement disagreements about it but respectful disagreements. And my view is that uh, a message of unity, a message of, um, of people working together is one that will always triumph over one of division. Uh, Simon Birmingham, the, the call for reform of Islam, which is coming not only from Pauline Hanson, but as she mentioned, from uh, Ian Hersey Ali and others, um, does that resonate with you? Tony, I think um, reform of uh, Islam depends, as always in these conversations, what do you mean when you say that? You know, what are people talking about and, indeed, what necessarily is the Islam, perhaps, that they are talking about in those conversations? Because you can talk about reform of the Catholic Church if you want, and you know the hierarchy you're pointing to. You could talk about perhaps reform of Islam in Australia, and you might be able to point to some leaders of the Islamic faith in Australia. But when you talk about it in a global context, I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense to put it that way. I, I do want to say something though uh, to Khalid, and that is the people who taunt you and abuse you deserve our condemnation. They deserve yeah. the condemnation of each and every one of us sitting on this panel. Just as course, just of course, as I would expect each and every one of us to condemn those who inspire acts of terrorism uh, or hatred in any other direction. You know, it is the hatred that we should be condemning and stamping out whomever it is 
directed at, whomever it is coming from, we want to make sure that that is what we are tackling. Uh, and by creating more hatred uh, is only, of course, going to worsen the problem in years to come. We've got another question on this subject. I'll quickly come to uh, Mohammed Atai. <clears throat> My name is Mohammed. Apparently, I look like the Australian idol Guy Sebastian. <laughs> hmm. I love my religion, Islam, and have been to more mosques than I have the supermarket. Perhaps the greatest influence for me and my family members to becoming hardworking uh, and focusing on education and hoping to be good citizens of this country was the emphasis placed on it by my religion, Islam. I have three siblings who are lawyers, and that made me go mad. I became a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the best way to increase understanding and mutual respect is through interaction. Senator Hansen, I understand you declined Sam Dastyari's offer for a halal, halal snack pack. She's reconsidering. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> With respect to that, would you be willing to take my offer to inviting you for lunch or dinner, whichever suits you best? with me and my Muslim family, and in respect to you and your beliefs, while we have something halal, I'll ensure what you have is something that's not halal. A haram snack pack. <laughs> <laughs> Would you kindly accept my invitation? That's a kind invitation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm quite happy to spend time with many Australians. and. With my one? <laughs> with your haram... What's a haram snack pack? No, he said with anything, his... Anything over a, a, a meat and a lunch, a dinner, just so we can uh, increase our understanding. And my offer extends to all people who might be... Um, who might dislike Islam and all Muslims. Um, now, Pauline, let would, me would, quote that... Would, no, would this, hold would, on would this, OK, no, sure, go ahead. No, made a comment mm. that I dislike Islam and all Muslims. I, that is not the case whatsoever. Okay. And as I said, I, I don't think have he said that, Muslims... actually. <laughs> I don't think he said that. What did you say? OK, let's clarify it. Sure. I said my offer extends to anyone who also might uh, dislike Islam and all Muslims in a, in a pursuit to create further understanding. So over any meal, whether it's halal or haram. <laughs> We can talk. You can get in touch with my office. See sure. what happens. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, uh, for you. <laughs> it, it's, it's a nice sort of uh, piece of reconciliation. What's been quite a tough argument, but I'm just so seriously. Would you be prepared to sit down with Muslims and particularly with his family, since he's often, and try and understand things from I, their perspective? Look, I know there are there are people in this country who are Muslims uh, of the Muslim faith hmm. that they want a peaceful life and they want to live without fear. And, yes, I think that's wonderful. We are a multiracial nation, but the bottom line is we, that we must be Australian under one culture, way of life and our laws. Tony, I think the and important I... question is, what's on the menu? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he, he mentioned well, haram meats. So there's no unbelievable. Tony, I think what Nick, what Nick is trying to say, that Nick and I will come round to your place, cos I'll never say no to a snack pack. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I think that's a surprisingly optimistic note on which to leave that um, quite tense discussion. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims, send a tweet using the hashtags FactCheck and Quanda. Keep an eye on our Twitter account for the verdicts. The next question comes from Peter Hoban. Thank you, Tony and panel. I feel my question now is rather insignificant compared to the topics we've been talking about, but here it goes anyway. Um, to the independent senators, do you realise the opportunity that you have been given to actually make decisions not shackled by vested interest party backers. The Australian people have made a deliberate and accurate decision to virtually neuter the Liberal and Labor discourse of petty party politics. We're jack of it. If either party thinks they have a mandate, they're dreaming. The nation has been crying out for real but equitable change. Can you provide a workable alternative? How will you negotiate in good faith? Start with Nick Xenophon. It is an incredible opportunity. It's an awesome opportunity to do the right thing. And for me, it's not about left or right. It's about right or wrong. Where do you 
where do you do things from the political centre? And I think there's been a, a vacuum in the political centre in this country. Uh, it's a great opportunity with, with my colleagues, with Sterling Griffiths, Sky Koshki Moore. Uh, we will be pushing uh, an agenda that I think is mainstream uh, for reform of predatory gambling. Most Australians want to see reform. The major parties don't want to touch it. For Australian made and Australian jobs, we are facing a crisis of manufacturing in this country and we need to see uh, a re turbocharging of manufacturing through some sensible and measured government intervention. And when it comes to government accountability, why is it that in this country, if you're a whistleblower, uh, instead of getting a medal, you go to jail? And we need to see changes to that which will change the culture of government. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity and working with my colleagues, all of them, to bring about some reforms. So, Nick Xenophon, I'm going to bring you in because you heard the passion expressed mm. in that mm. of someone who wants to see something outside the major parties, mm. uh, wants to see change. Mm. And the big question is, will you use your voting power to, to push through those kind of reforms you just mentioned? Will you refuse to vote for various things the government wants unless you get your way? Yeah. That's the simple question. Sure. It's a simple question, but sadly it doesn't lend itself to a simple answer. Perhaps you it would should. Do, well, it should, but it doesn't. I mean, in my first speech in the Senate eight years ago, I said the trouble with horse trading is that sometimes you end up with a donkey or, worse still, you make an ass of yourself. I think the key issue here uh, is that you use every opportunity to try and bring about reform. Sometimes it's, it's incremental. You, you bring about change, you bring about reform, you insist on an amendment uh, which will actually advance those causes. Uh, but sometimes you need to win both sides of politics to say that it's not in the national interest to sign up to a free trade agreement which will kill jobs or to abandon manufacturing which will destroy many tens of thousands of jobs in this country. OK, so I'm going to hear from the, uh, from the senators representing what two new voting blocks in the Senate. Pauline Hanson. Um, well, first of all, you, you seem to be confident you're going to get up to seven <coughs> senators. That's, we, a, that's a pretty big we've call, got isn't it? we four and possibly up to seven seats mm. right, that we could win. Yes, it is. Have it's you said a thank a you impact. note to Malcolm Turnbull? <laughs> I've been campaigning for the last 18 years, so I think I've put a lot of work into it. And I, I've got to say thank you to Malcolm Turnbull for actually creating double, double dissolution, dissolution, plus also changing the voting reform package that is actually more democratic to the voters and rather than major political parties controlling the preferences. But the whole fact is, yes, it is going to be a huge responsibility to take my place in the Senate with the other senators. I have always said right from the very beginning that I will support anyone who is elected to, to the government, right, who is the government, which is Malcolm Turnbull. Now, in so far as to say that if they pass legislation that I believe is right for Australia and the Australian people, they will get my full support. If I don't, then I will look at making amendments to the changes and I will explain to the people why. Peter was so right. This is why the major political parties lost so many votes at this election, because the people are fed up with the major political parties. They feel they haven't been listened to and their voice is not being heard. So many changes need to be made in this country and right across the board, every time I'm out in the public, there is another issue and another issue. I've pushed um, since prior to the election and since about changes to the Family Law Act and I mentioned that in my maiden speech. Nothing has happened with that. I'm pleased to see now that the National Party are actually taking it up and looking at changing legislation to it, which I want to work with them on it and I will be putting up my own policies. So, um, you're, well, uh, we, won't so go, we won't go into the detail of that, but let me just ask yeah. you this in a general sense. Um, I've asked the same question to Nick Xenophon. Will you use your voting power to force change? Or will you just try and negotiate slowly over time with the government to see if you can incrementally change things? Because you'll, you could be in a position to actually say, well, I'm not going to vote for your major pieces of budget legislation or all sorts of other things unless, hey. you, unless you do what I want. No, I won't do that. And I don't think that's right. I think what it's all about, if they put up legislation that is correct and I believe it's right for the people, I will support that. It, to be in this position is very important for the people. The people are relying on, on me and my other senators and, and every other senator in that parliament to make the right decision for their well-being and their future. And I don't believe you sell your soul because you might, you know, make a little bit of gain somewhere else. You have to be there for accountability and honesty and for the people. And I'll always say that. OK, very briefly, because the first test will come soon when there's yep. a joint sitting of the... House, uh, will your senators vote for the ABCC, 
uh, the Building Corruption uh, Commission, which, which, is, which is at the centre of the, of the uh, double dissolution. Will you Tony, vote for it? I haven't had a chance to look at the, the legislation on it. I haven't even moved into an office. I don't have staff. I don't have resources, as what the other senators have to be informed of what the bill is. I would like to sit down and have a talk with unions, and I would like to have a talk with the, with the small businesses as well. It is apparently not working. And we have... And you know, I want to know what is the best way to move forward with this. You can't have unions dictating and controlling small business and running of the country or the government. So you have to find um, the balance there. OK. All right. Well, I think we've got partial answer there. Um, now, let's go to the next yeah, largest... Thanks, well, in fact, the largest right. voting independent voting bloc, or the Greens are not an independent voting bloc. They're the largest party on the crossbench. So um, what, what's the Greens' position going to be? Thanks, Tony. And thanks, Peter, for your question. I think you're right to point out that the support for major parties has been dropping, and you echo the sentiment of so many other people who um, have started to look elsewhere. Uh, what's been mentioned and raised with me many, many times is that people feel that the big parties are not governing for the community anymore um, or thinking about the environment. They're simply doing the bidding of the very large uh, donors that contribute to their political coffers and whether that's the gambling industry, um, in some cases the tobacco industry, of course the fossil fuel sector, the coal mining companies make very generous contributions, uh, whether that's property developers, um, those people get their views heard Heard. They get access to ministers. Um, they get to topple prime ministers in some cases. Uh, they get their agenda through the parliament, but the community, the environment, um, the fact that it's meant to be a representative democracy seems to be easily forgotten in the wake of those golden rivers of dollars that flow through. So I think that's part of the reason why the support for the big parties is dropping. I want to come back to a point that um, Ms Hanson raised earlier. I don't actually think that people supported her party because they share her racist views. I think what's happening is the economy is changing and people are nervous about it changing and they're feeling left behind, particularly in regional areas. And I think what they haven't heard from either of the big parties is a plan for how we can bring people along in that change, that change to a clean energy economy that we know the world is making. They feel left behind. They don't know what their place is. There's been a third of the coal workforce already sacked by the big coal companies. Now, where is the plan for their future? They could have a prosperous future in clean energy, um, in all sorts of other sunrise industries. Well, today you just got today you just got a uh, you got someone to negotiate with on both sides of the equation because an environment minister who's also the minister for energy. Well, that's right, and I have mixed views about that. I think if we had a parliament that wasn't hostage to fossil fuel donations, that would be a wonderful combination and a powerful one, because obviously the key to environmental health and economic health is tackling global warming, the biggest challenge that the whole world is facing, and that's where we know our prosperity will lie and where genuine job creation will come in. But we're not hearing even that rhetoric, let alone the actual transition plans from the major parties. Okay, so we'll move on to our. That's uh, why folk have been so discontented. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm going to move on to. Our uh, next question, uh, which is on this subject, we'll bring in the major parties on this one, from Laura Holt. Good evening, Senators. As the Coalition and Opposition are not capable of a significant reduction in government spending of about $30 billion a year for the next three years, should the crossbench take up this challenge and consequently save the pension system, the NDIS, Medicare and health and education funding? Because when the money runs out, there will be no money for these services. Let's start with Simon Birmingham first. Now, I mean, do you accept the, the, the premise there that you need to save $30 billion a year in order to save the big services which people expect, health, education and so on? Well, we know that uh, the budget is under pressure, uh, Laura, and we absolutely hit the nail on the head there that there are significant savings required to still realise ultimately the budget projections we have to bring the budget back to surplus. Now, Labor went to the election proposing a raft of tax increases and that was their model to ultimately perhaps get to surplus that would have put us on a path to have uh, the highest level of taxation uh, as a percentage of the economy in the nation's history essentially. We rejected that, that's not our approach. We think Australia as a whole pays enough tax at present. We committed in the last budget to make sure we do more about multinational tax evasion, uh, to make the superannuation tax system fairer and to deal with some excesses there. We want to make sure that the tax reform we have is fair but we don't want to grow uh, the actual scale of taxation in Australia because that can only harm uh, our competitiveness. That does mean we need to restrain spending so that we can guarantee ongoing support for Medicare, for schools, 
uh, for the NDIS, for the types of services you identified. And yes, I think the question does then come to, obviously we have to work cooperatively with whomever in the Senate, the Labor Party, if they're willing to uh, actually honour the areas they said they deliver as savings, uh, the Greens, if they're willing to, any of the crossbenchers as to how it is we can realise the types of savings that are required. But it takes two or potentially a lot more than two in the new Senate to tango. And uh, you know, we, will, you know, we will need them to be part of the solution. Um, we can hopefully extend successfully the olive branch to those willing to work with us to realise savings, but they will have to be willing to come on that journey as well, or else the type of concern, broken system if you like, Peter, uh, that you spoke about in your question, will only get deeper as time goes on, if in fact no agreement can be reached. Okay, well, I'm going to go to uh, the other major party representative. Now, Sam Dessiari, will the Labor Party uh, join in a kind of crusade to cut government spending? Um, we're certainly prepared to join in a crusade to actually pass as much legislation as we can. And, uh, you know, look, if this was... Uh, someone needs to may perhaps remind Simon the election's yeah. over. You won. Congratulations. So, so, so Sam, uh, just, just no, a quick... No, 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 no. Would it start with you guys supporting the areas of savings that you what, adopted what, yourselves? Here's what we wouldn't support. A no, 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 let me... I will get to this. A $50 billion tax cut for big business, seven and a half it's billion of which, is no, no, seven and a half billion of which is going to go towards the four big banks is not the right approach, no. But what we will do is this, and, 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 and you know, you talked about it takes two to tango or perhaps even more in this Senate, and Simon, I'll, I will always dance with you. Um, <laughs> um, we are completely genuine. Who's choosing the music? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 90s or 80s, what are we going to do? Sam, Sam, can I just interrupt I, you? I just think you like, right now Sorry. you're doing more talking than dancing. So I, I, can you just get to the point of which measures you will actually pass? The measures that we took to this election, uh, we, we intend to be passing through the Senate, and, but at the same time we will work with the government to do the measures that need to happen provided they fit within the platform of what we took to the election So will campaign. you roll over on the superannuation reforms? That's one of their, um, their taxing promises. Well, what we said regarding the superannuation reforms going into the election was that we took the government at face value uh, in what they said, said that we need to do a proper review as they went into caretaker. The problem the government has currently on superannuation matters is actually their own backbench and their own MPs. But we were very clear going into the campaign that there does need to be a look at this issue of retrospectivity, but beyond that, uh, those measures that are reasonable will be supported. And Mr. Shorten and Mr. and the Prime Minister, as I understand, have both made it very clear that in this new Senate we should be working. Okay. Together. Now you want to hear an answer to the specific question you put. So let's let's hear because I think you did say you would answer the question as to whether you would support the measures you previously supported. Of course, we'll support the measures that we took to the election. Yeah. So, so the savings measures of ours that you changed your mind on during the election campaign, the, you will now support. The measures that we took to the election and we got a mandate from the Australian people on are our measures. Sorry, is that a slippery answer? No, or not at all. It's going to be even clearer. Are you saying? Are you saying? Are you saying? You, so you've done it. You actually have backflipped on yeah. this thing. We have taken a series of measures to the election. We got a mandate from the Australian people, and they are party platform. That is what we took to the polls. Okay. That is what Sorry, Bill Shaw's election. Are you convinced that, um, that you're actually on the same page here? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful from what I hear, Sam. So and from yeah, what now, now, admittedly, he talks about the clarity of the superannuation position they took to the election, where in fact Labor's position was, uh, we'll bank the savings the government says, but if we get elected, we're not quite sure how we'll deliver no, those we savings. No, we said we'll take you at face value and we'll do a review. Yeah, well, you yeah, said yeah. you... And you had problems but, but with I'm sorry, but, uh, Simon, but Simon Birmingham, you're reviewing this yourself, aren't you, the retrospective part of it? Isn't that what, uh, what Scott Morrison is doing right now because there's such a backlash in your own party about no. the retrospectivity issue? Look, Tony, there are some technical concerns that might be tweaked. <laughs> but so is, you know. is, is retrospectivity <laughs> in principle a technical concern? Or well, is no, it, in no, fact, no, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't want to get into debate. I, yeah. oh, no, no, I don't want to get into debate. I reject the, the, argument, the, the other side. The other, I reject the argument that uh, the proposals are retrospective. Retrospective tax changes, not. as in fact the Prime Minister explained on 7:30 on right. this network well, only you can, a couple you can, of hours ago. You can have ago. this argument in the party room. Let's hear from the other panelists. And oh, okay. well, refer to the Prime Minister's transcript then. Okay, I think, all right. On that one. Uh, Pauline Hanson. Um, so he, the whole series of things here, and uh, Sam Dessiari raised one of them: the 50 billion dollar uh, tax cut to uh, to business, which is a key part of the government's platform. Will you support and that? And that goes out for how many years, Sam? Okay. Yeah. 
That's right, exactly 10. So we're talking about now. We need to address it now. The, the amount of money that this country owes, we cannot keep going the way that we're going, paying $13.5 billion a year in interest alone on our debt. The thing is, they talk about the age of entitlements is over. Well, let's start with the parliament at the top from the, from the politicians. Let's, let's prove the rest of the country that we can actually rein in our belts and start saving money. But does that, now, can, I, can I just come interrupt there? Does that mean... Sorry, thank you. Does that mean with the $50 billion tax cut over 10 years that you'll reject that, is, that, that because small, it's... No, that's no, small business, OK. No, it's not what no, is, it's that's definition. going out over 10 years. What I've got to say is that a lot of the other... So do you that, support that? that? The yeah, so just very briefly, do you support that one? In, in principle, no, I don't. The way it is. No, I think there's other, cu other cuts that can be made to, that we need to do it now, not over a period of 10 years. And I think that we need to do it. Foreign, foreign aid that we're giving, even monies that we're giving to corrupt countries, that we need to look at where that money is going and rein that in. We need to look at the welfare bill, $180 billion a year. That needs to be investigated because I think it's rorted with the welfare bill. That needs to be investigated as well. There's so many other, even government contracts and jobs, they are actually out of, out of control and I want to see accountability of what we're paying out the taxpayers' dollars to get these jobs done. OK, now I'm going to go quickly to uh, Nick Xenophon, so I'd just like to hear your position on um, whether, there's a, whether the government actually has a mandate for all these savings measures. The governments have a mandate to introduce legislation and the Senate has a mandate to scrutinise that legislation. That's how I see it. Um, <laughs> And do, you, do you have a mandate, given the way the Senate is set up, to reject whatever you want to reject? Well, if a majority of the Senate rejects it, uh, then that's, it's a brutal arithmetic of it. But I'll work constructively with the government. We need to look at reinventing government in the 21st century in this country. We need more transparent government, more accountable government. We need to make sure that money isn't wasted. Uh, but uh, I'll work with good, in good faith with the government. Is, is a $50 billion tax cut to business, small and large, wasted? I'll support, well, I'll support it up to $10 million. But right now, we are facing a tsunami of job loss. We are saving... We're 10 million. Oh, 10 million. 10, 10 million. million so we give it 10 million businesses. Yeah, 10, 10 million. 10 million size yeah. of business. We are facing a tsunami of job loss in this country. Up to 200,000 jobs will be lost when the auto sector cro closed down at the end of next year. Uh, that, to me, is a greater priority for government involvement than a big tax cut. And yeah. Larissa Waters. Thank you, Laura, for your question. I thought it was an interesting one that you focused on cuts when, in fact, what we hear a lot of talk about is cuts, but we don't hear a lot of talk about revenue raising. Now, we put a whole raft of revenue raising proposals throughout the course of the campaign, um, including getting rid of the $24 billion over the Ford estimates, that's four years, in free money that goes to the fossil fuel sector in things like cheap diesel and accelerated depreciation. Nobody else gets those sorts of perks. $24 billion, there's one saving for you. $50 billion, of course, free, for free the money. Is a fair, you know, this, is, you know, this is about whether or not you know, the extent of tax that Australian businesses pay. And the more tax you make Australian businesses pay, the less competitive they'll be on the world stage. Well, That's just, the reality of it, Larissa. They're not paying much tax and you're just giving well, it all back no, to them. No, those businesses, really are, pay, so those well. businesses <laughs> are paying taxes in royalties, they're paying taxes in company tax, their employees are paying income tax, and they're, they're paying GST. Cooking, and they're cooking the planet with climate uh, change, which is going to cost us all. Just briefly doing the sums for you here, I'm not sure quite how they work out, but if Pauline Hanson did have seven senators and she doesn't want the big business tax cut... Uh, element of it, if uh, Nick Xenophon doesn't at his senators, if the Greens don't and Labor doesn't, doesn't that mean that your biggest policy is sunk? Well, Tony, we, uh, we will put... What an episode. We will put <laughs> our policies to the Parliament uh, and we'll work with each of the crossbenchers. Uh, and you've heard from Nick uh, that he is willing to talk about elements of that policy. Mm. I think you've heard from Pauline sympathy for small business and Australian small business and uh, certainly the type of tax cuts that we are talking about over the next few years are tax cuts that would overwhelmingly benefit family-owned Australian no, businesses. No, but it's, just a quick, it's a very simple question on the numbers here. Um, it doesn't look like you've got the numbers no, I, I to get the $50 billion tax cut through, right or wrong. Well, what, I, I, I don't accept I that know. we won't get anything through, Tony. No, and that no, is exactly no, no, no what I'm talking about do. the full $50 billion, your big policy at the election. Well, our policy at the election was staged over 10 years, as we've talked about on this panel tonight. So you're ready to compromise on this? Uh, we have said all along since election night that, of course, we will work with the parliament we're given. We'll negotiate and work with the crossbenchers in a spirit of good faith. 
We'll present our policies as we took them to the election. Maybe not super, though. You we'll might present our policies as we took them to the election, uh, including super. With some tweaks. As long as it creates jobs, you know, the tax cuts, but that's what, something that I need to look at. It's I'm not going to make policy on the run here. I haven't been in Parliament, I haven't had the resources, I haven't had access to, you know, the offices of the, of the, um, the Prime Minister or uh, to actually get the briefing with all this. So I'm not going to make policy on the run here. But if I can see that these tax cuts or whatever is going to create jobs, that's what we need to get this country going. Who would you, who would you want to hear that? From who's who's well, actually, actually whose Scott opinion Morrison, would Scott Morrison you'd accept rang Scott me Morrison's up and he okay. said he would give me access to the treasury and actually the budget so to give me a briefing on that to see what it's about mm. and it's a huge job to do it and I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm going to you know knock it back or not going to do it to make an informed opinion decision about it I will wait till I get in there and get a briefing from the government and make an informed decision about so, it so the you, whole would you regard about, we would you regard infrastructure projects sorry to going jobs going in this country I wish you would look at you know I have a policy with, which is far better to get apprenticeship schemes going I will present that to to the government mm. to look at this because I think that's where we need to address it get mm. industry manufacturing going get the country going again. You know, you talk about the Greens and the climate change, you're shutting down this country. You're creating more of a cost. Yeah, you nearly fell off the stool because you agree with me. Because you, you call, you're creating more of a cost to average coal industry everyday down, Pauline, families out markets. of their increased cost. You know, the whole, even climate change, that needs to debate it. Let's have the oh, true facts know, about this We know this that you don't well. accept but, okay. Sorry, but the facts of Ms Hanson, on, on the $50 billion cuts, does. when you meet with Treasury, just ask this one question. Yes. How many billion of it are going to the four big banks? Just ask that one question, please. I will ask that question Thank as well. You. And I'd like to know why the pair of you... I said 20 years ago that multinationals not, were not paying their tax in this country. You come into the budget last year of $3.9 that you'll collect over, over the next, what, three years. That is peanuts compared to what they should be paying in this country. You're out by hundreds of billions of dollars. OK, I'm really sorry to say to everybody on the panel, that's all we have time for tonight. And on the evidence of tonight, it's certainly going to be a very interesting Senate. Please thank our panel, Sam Dastiari, Pauline Hanson, Larissa Waters, Simon Birmingham, Nick Xenophon. Now, for the next... For the next two weeks, I'll be taking a break. Virginia Trioli will be sitting in this chair. Good luck, Virginia. And uh, with the new ministry only announced today, next week's panel is still under construction. So please join Virginia Trioli next week to get more answers to, on your questions here on Q&A. I'll see you again very soon. Good night.